starting with my routine announcement, I'm welcoming you to the colloquium. I'm Scott Osterwal, Creative Director of the MIT Education Arcade. Um, I want to welcome you to tonight's colloquium. And just to, again, to go over the ground rules with Zoom, um, we run this as a webinar, which means that uh, um, the members of the CMS graduate program and faculty are on as panelists just so that they can participate in the conversation after the presentation. If we recognize you as somebody from the MIT community, we'll try to promote you to panelists as well. If you remain a guest, you're also welcome to participate. We just ask you to um, ask questions in the Q&A. Um, but you're more than welcome to be here this week and every week for the colloquium. Um, with that, I will turn things over to Professor Vivek Bald, who's going to actually introduce tonight's colloquium. Right. Thank you, Scott. Um, well, it's it's really a, a pleasure to be able to to welcome Mauricio Cordero to the colloquium. It's been a pleasure to to have Mauricio as part of the CMS community for the last few years. And, um, uh, just a little about Mauricio, he has worked in the arts and underground scene since the 1980s. He established the fanzine Caution and served as the education coordinator and program director at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston. Uh, in France, he opened his own art gallery in Tours. Uh, returning to the US, he served as executive director at the Revolving Museum and was also a founding director of Mill Number no. 5 an indoor Victorian streetscape, which I'd like to hear a bit more about in the Q&A. Um, Cordero now teaches comics primarily and is a part-time lecturer at MIT. He is currently teaching making comics and sequential art and lecturing in the visual story graphic novel. Uh, his work has been published in Double Nickels Forever, Dollars and Cents, MIT's GradX comic series and the Fashion Institute of Technology's Black Stories Matter. Border X, a crisis in graphic detail is available at all major online retailers and through the website borderx.com. And we're gonna hear about Border X. Uh, just okay. I, I think I've lost audio. You can hear me? Great, okay, so um, I'm just gonna let this roll. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mauricio Cordero. I'm a lecturer at MIT. I teach a course on comics production. I'm also the founder and the editor of Border X. Today, I'll be in conversation with Professor James Parody, as well as Professor Warren Binford, who is the president and the founder of Project Amplify. We'll also hear from several of the artists who contributed uh, to this volume. And first, we'll hear a special message from someone whose actions really inspired me to take action. It's Senator Jeffrey Merkley from Oregon. Welcome to today's presentation of the Border X Project. I'm Oregon Senator Jeff Merkley, and the topic is one I'm personally very invested in. Two years ago, just days after Attorney General Jeff Sessions announced the administration's zero tolerance policy, which criminalized refugees and purposefully traumatized children for fleeing persecution and unspeakable violence, I flew down to the border to see the situation for myself. I walked through a Customs and Border Protection patrol station where I saw rows of chain link cages filled with young children. I stopped in front of one where young boys were lining up by height, the youngest in front. He was just knee high to a grasshopper, maybe four years old at most. I couldn't believe what I saw in that facility. I could not believe that our government, the US government, was deliberately traumatizing children, ripping them out of their parents' arms to discourage refugee families from seeking safe harbor in the United States. It still haunts me today. It should haunt every American. I also went to visit another facility where I'd heard that hundreds of boys, perhaps as many as a thousand, were being held who had been separated from their parents. 
I couldn't imagine a thousand boys incarcerated in that former Walmart. And I couldn't imagine the experiences they had gone through at the hands of our government. I wanted to find out the details. The on-site manager agreed to come outside and talk to me, but instead he called the police to have me escorted off the, policy, off the property. Well, when he did that, millions of Americans were watching on Facebook Live. And those Americans wondered, just as I was wondering, what is our government hiding behind those locked doors? Never before would I have believed that our government, the United States of America, would plunge ahead with a strategy of traumatizing children deliberately. But it was real. By the end of the year, more than 15,000 refugee children were held in camps across our nation. Today, at this moment, our American government has still been unable to reunite more than 600 of them with their parents. And all of those children, all those many thousands, still have to live with the trauma of their experiences inflicted at the hands of our government. But child separation was only the beginning of the Trump administration's war on refugees. As we all know, there were many more pieces to that policy. But it's up to us now, with Trump heading out the door, to confront the pain and suffering, to do all we can to remedy the pain and suffering of those children, and do all we can to restore fairness and justice to the immigration system. We need to ensure that policies like child separation never, ever happen again. I know that that's why many of you have come to this gathering today. Thank you. Thank you for working to understand the cruelty unleashed on our southern border and how we can work together to end it. Working together, let's relight Lady Liberty's torch. Why don't you say something about uh what got you, uh, you know, thinking about uh, comics and borders? The origin was really anger and rage uh, that I was feeling. And I, I hadn't felt this angry since I was a teenager, you know, rebelling against Reagan and Bush mm -hmm. and living, growing up in D.C. around politics. I mean, that was or meat and potatoes down there. We, we thought about t politics all the time, even as a high school student. And, um, you know, back then the rage was directed uh, towards music. Mm -hmm. So I realized that, you know, if I was going to uh, bring any sort of substantial record or evidence of my rebellion, it had to be in the form of a comic book. And so I started to directly contact a few friends and say, you know, hey, what do you think about this? And, and the response was overwhelmingly positive. But I was just curious if there was some set of episodes or something that uh, set this off. Mm -hmm. I think the, the first incident was Senator Jeff Merkley uh, trying to get into the detention camp and being turned away. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't at all what he said on camera as he was turned away. It was the absence of footage from inside the border camp, seeing how much the political structure in, in our government had caved into this new doctrine that was very, I feel, racist, uh, very anti-asylum. These are people who are, in most cases, fleeing a situation that is unlivable, untenable for, for them and, and their families, and they're trying to make a better life. But as we know, um, the person who is in the White House right now uh, referred to them as rapists and murderers and drug dealers. Not having a view inside the camps concerned me, knowing that just about everything that comes out of that person's mouth is either projection or just a lie. My, my tweets weren't going anywhere. <laughs> You know, and certainly didn't satisfy that rage. And so, you know, that DIY punk rock spirit came back to me and I said, well, I've, I've got to make all this concrete and found out about Project Amplify, who published testimony of migrants that were presented in Flores versus Barr. The uh, construction of artistic work 
requires a kind of a suspension of rage and some of the uh, the emotions that might lead to starting it. Uh, so how did that work? Well, when I opened up the project to the yeah. world at large, um, I realized I was getting a lot of rage back. And that's mm -hmm. when I installed a ban on the word Trump. And that is where the rage turned into productivity. You know, it started with rage and then quickly became compassion. And then I realized I had to steer the ship. You can only rage so much in a piece before it becomes too literal to be art. And it becomes a, a form of almost propaganda or something like that. There, 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 there's this long history of Americans trying to figure out uh, how they're going to exist in a world that uh, is is way more complicated than some may understand. Uh, as far as indigenous, uh, there are hundreds of indigenous people on every continent of the uh, every continent of the of, of, of the globe, mm -hmm. and uh, this is one focus that you have on this particular location but it it sort of stands does it not for uh, you know a, a kind of universal problem that has to do with borders absolutely and, and at the very beginning i made the decision to include science fiction and fiction um as one of the sections that we would have in the the final work to get to the universal um truths in this struggle, we, we need fiction, we need science fiction, we need allegories uh, that go beyond the headlines and beyond this moment um, and even beyond this planet. Um, and, and so I, I really enjoyed um, curating that section and, and finding the artists. It, it was um, wonderful to get so many different um, points of view looking inward. Um, and modalities, you know, science fiction, uh, straight documentary, uh, some reportage. So maybe um, uh, and personal uh, since life. you're you're bridging on some of these these questions, uh, maybe say a little more about the process of making this. Uh, how does a person uh, decide and then go about making a uh, collection like this? Because uh, <laughs> yeah, well, when you get to the point where uh, the rage outweighs common sense, I think that's. That's where you get started. I found it myself kind of alone at the beginning and then people did step up um, as the project uh, grew. Um, so I guess the, the first step is uh, deciding you're going to do it and defining it and scale it to what your um, abilities are. Or um, the way I did it was, uh, <laughs> naively scaling it way above my abilities and having to grow into those abilities. Um, so, you know, I have experience in producing comics and putting them together. I know all the tech specs, et cetera. Um, but there's a, a much greater learning curve um, in terms of hurting 70 contributors. And these contributors sometimes, uh, uh, I mean, a comic is, is not always done just by a single author uh, and generally it's it's done by there's an anchor there's a uh, a colorist uh, there's someone who deals with the uh, uh, the actual narratives the bubbles and all the things that uh, so how did that all work out did did, did most of these uh, get done by I, I, I noticed that uh, almost all of them have multiple multiple uh, constructors there, there are multiple people involved right well that was uh part of what uh took a lot of legwork at the beginning was playing matchmaker mm -hmm. now there, there were people that came uh with a team and and were ready to go uh a few in a few cases uh there was existing work that we could just take and reprint where the artists had all the rights to uh, reprint. So uh, that happened, but I did play matchmaker and uh, really took time to read scripts, pass them along to a penciler or artists. And um, 
you know, at that point we determined whether the artist would take on the entire project or if I had to go out and find a letter or colorist. Um, so really uh, trying to find um, what a comfortable or doable workload was for each participant. Yeah, th there were a few um, people that were just really helpful. Uh, Royal Torres, for example, um, was one person who stepped up and helped a lot with the editing. And he got a lot of teams together, found a lot of, uh, uh, tied up a lot of loose ends. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm curious about the organization. Uh... Uh, which I, I think is very, very effective, uh, but you, you have the exhibits, which are sort of, uh, you know, uh, reviews, interviews, and things of that sort that were captured. These are testimonials, uh, but then you have the response, and you have the context, and then ruminations, and then a series of posters. So I'm just curious about that that collection, which I think is a, a rich variety of um, possibilities for this this form. As the work began to arrive, I saw a pattern emerge, and the pattern strengthened over time into what seemed like four mm -hmm. good sections um, for the book. Mm -hmm. The four sections are the exhibits, the response, the context, and ruminations. So I felt that the factual and most heart-wrenching work should appear at the beginning of the book to establish uh, what, what we're talking about when we say migrant crisis. These, the exhibits are based on verbatim transcripts of migrant experiences mm -hmm. in the detention camp. And these testimonies were presented to the Supreme Court in the ongoing Flores versus Barr case to mitigate mm -hmm. the just devastating nature of these testimonies. Mm -hmm. I chose to, to highlight agents and agencies that are working to create hope uh, by aiding migrants in, mm -hmm. you know, in the field. And so the response section uh, collects a few of those stories. Then the context uh, section collects personal reflections mm -hmm. and historic accounts mm -hmm. uh, to try to offer a broad contextual mm -hmm. background uh, for the, the volume. Mm -hmm. The last section, the ruminations mm -hmm. offers fiction, allegory, metaphor, and adaptation to get at some of the underlying themes and universal truths mm -hmm. uh, that we can find in the crisis. And closing out the volume, there's a, a, a small section of posters that were created especially uh, for the collection in the vein of sort of works, works progress administration, uh, sort of war era posters. Yeah. Do you have any kind of expectations for the impact of uh, a piece of work like this? Or is there, is it kind of more diffuse, uh, kind of cultural, just uh, uh, awareness? Or how do, you, how do you think about impact? One impact I'd hope for is precisely what we're talking about today sharing this model with the public in hopes of inspiring the replication for other social causes. Uh, another is to create a graphic history of this uh, moment so that we don't forget these atrocities that are being carried out in the name of the U.S. Also bearing witness to the suffering and torment endured by the subjects of the, in this book who they've got so much to offer uh, or society, yet they're treated like criminals for seeking a better life. You know, asylum is not a crime. Crossing the border illegally is a misdemeanor, yet it seems like they're being punished for a, a felony or, or some other serious crime. Finally, we set out to, to help a nonprofit, and the one we decided on, the South Texas Human uh, Rights Center, is a really good example of an organization with a, an extremely modest budget and they're creating a, a real benefit to society and uh, you know, the, the funds we've collected and the proceeds that we continue to generate uh, have gone to help them carry out their mission and we'll hear a bit more about uh, the South Texas Human Rights Center later on in the presentation. How does distribution work and things of that sort? 
the question about distribution format came up immediately. Should I try to find a publisher and potentially wait years to see any sort of result, or take a risk and self-publish and rely mostly on word of mouth? I chose the latter, and despite many difficulties, delays, complications, some of them due to COVID, um, in the end I think it was the best choice. By using a print-on-demand service, we had a lower risk uh, than vanity printing, and we were able to get the volume into production eight months after the start of the project. So that's eight months to contact all the contributors, create the content, edit, design, layout, and get it to print and distribution. Also, by serving as the publisher, we can continue to generate profit, which goes to on the South Texas mm -hmm. Human Rights Center. And the title is currently being distributed worldwide. So um, it's available for about the same cost as buying mm -hmm. it here in the US. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'd say the benefits are similar to the traditional publishing route, but with a much higher revenue stream and lower risks. It gives a, it, it sort of gives a new meaning to public art, uh, you know, uh, the, the creation of, uh, and, and collaborating uh, together to try to address issues that uh, are really outstanding and urgent. And we need more of this, not less. Uh, this is a pioneering effort, I would say, uh, just from what I know about comics. So uh, you've kind of invented a new process. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a really brilliant project. So. I just, Thank you. You know, and I'm very, very glad that it happened. And you know, uh, I hope I hope you continue. <laughs> Let's get started. So, Warren, can you tell me a little bit about the the origin of Project Amplify, um, how it got started, why it got started? when it got started and what the mission is. Yes, Project Amplify was started in summer of 2019 after uh, approximately a dozen of us left the Clint Border Patrol facility where we had discovered over 350 children being kept in a windowless warehouse, a loading dock, jail cells, and tents in the desert. The children were hungry, they were filthy, they had been severely uh, neglected, uh, there was no one supervising them. They were sleeping on concrete floors, concrete blocks next to open toilets. Um, they had been taken away from, you know, family members and, uh, and were basically left alone to take care of each other. There was widespread illness. There was a, a flu and respiratory illness that was going around. There was a lice infestation. And we went to the public about what we had discovered because the situation had gotten so dangerous and so extreme. Under, under President Trump's administration uh, in the year leading up to that summer of 2019, at least seven children had died uh, in government custody or shortly after they had been released from government custody. And we were afraid that more children were going to die. The president denounced it as fake news, said that our accounts were grossly exaggerated. Um, he and Vice President uh, Pence assured that the children were well taken care of, which was not true. And they put Vice President Pence both on the Sunday Talking Head shows and then Air Force Two and flew him down to Texas, where he toured another facility. They dressed the children in government issued brightly colored sweatsuits and then had the children pose for the camera and wave and give a thumbs up that they were being well taken care of. And we realized that there was a false counter narrative that was being advanced at the highest levels of government and wondered how it was that we could counter that narrative so that these children's experiences and their histories were not erased. And we decided to create a website and post all of the publicly available testimonies of the children on that website so that any member of the public who wanted to inform themselves could go and read the children's accounts and, um, and discover for themselves what the truth was, what the children said in their own words. And then we called out to artists and 
writers and musicians and everyday Americans and ask them to read the children's accounts and find ways to amplify their voices. What was different in 2019 than previous years? Yeah, so I started visiting the camps in 2017. You know, sometimes children are in cages and sometimes they're in jail cells. So it's important for people to understand that um, there are many facilities in which these children are being kept and none of them that I visited are appropriate for children. Mm -hmm. And what was different about what happened in the last four years is the number of children who are being held, the length of time in which they were being held, the number of children who were being removed from their families, including their parents, and the, um, the level of abuse they were experiencing and the number of deaths prior to the children who died um, in, in 2018 and 2019, no child had died in, you know, no, ch you know, immigrant child, you know, our child in migration had died in government custody in almost a decade. And, and we saw approximately seven children that we know of, you know, there may have been more, but we know of seven children who had died um, in the year leading up to our visit to Clint in June 2019. So that's what we were saying, conditions so bad that children were literally dying. And, um, and it was, you know, last year alone in 2019, there were approximately uh, 69,000 children who had been detained by the U.S. government. And that was a significantly increased number from what we've seen in years past. So, so are they committing a crime by crossing the border? No, it depends. When someone comes to the United States for the purpose of claiming asylum, they are not required to have documentation. So people who are coming to the United States to claim asylum for that purpose are not committing a crime. They have the right to do that under US law. They have the right to do that under international law. Mm -hmm. However, if someone is coming to the United States for the purpose of, for example, getting a job, um, they are committing a crime. And that crime is a misdemeanor. It's the equivalent of playing your radio too loud or your music too loud. And so what that means is when the Trump administration implemented the zero tolerance policy and said, we're gonna take children away from anybody who crosses the border, um, you know, without consideration of a, you know, whether or not they're coming for asylum, they were essentially violating the law. And then when they took children away from people who weren't here for finding asylum, but for jobs, Literally, they were taking their children away for a misdemeanor that was the equivalent of playing their music too loud. Starting in January 2019, they started to implement what's called the Migrant Protection Protocols, um, also known as Remain in Mexico. And, um, and many of the children and families that normally would be in the United States while their asylum claims are being heard are being sent to these very dangerous border towns in Mexico where that are controlled by gangs, that are controlled by cartels, where there's a lot of human trafficking. Remember that Mexico is one of the lead source countries for human trafficking in America. And rather than keep the children in the United States with their family, their parents, other loved ones, they're sending them to these really dangerous border towns and then keeping them there for what could be a two, three, four, five year process. In March, 2020, the Trump administration basically started to block all arrivals to the United States um, and blamed it on COVID, which is so ironic because this administration doesn't recognize, you know, the severity or danger of COVID. The hundreds of children that we do know about are actually being kept in black box locations um, such as hotels. And so we're having a really hard time tracking those children. Is it worse, you know, being in a tent in Mexico with your parents for several years you know, or, or what's likely to be, you know, several years, or is it worse to be separated from your parents for, you know, an 89 days, which is the average, was the average under the Trump administration until recently, and, and, and kept in Border Patrol facilities, you know, or a, a Walmart, um, but then reunited with your family after that. And, um, and, and I guess where I come down is that both of these are horrible and neither one of them is acceptable. And what we really need to do is under a new administration and with a new Congress, we need to create legal protections to make sure that the brutality that children have been subjected to under this administration never happens again. And I've already spoken with 
uh, Senator Merkley's office uh, about working together to uh, you know, draft legislation that makes sure that this never happens again. We need to get to the root problem. Part of the root problem is, is trying to support security in the children's home countries so that they don't need to migrate. But for those who do need to migrate to make sure that they are treated humanely throughout the asylum process. Uh, we also, you know, uh, Michael Bohanek of Human Rights Watch and I also are um, working on a policy piece that describes how to undo all of the damage that's been done by the Trump administration. And we hope to have that published in January. And I mean, we're already seeing such a severe drop in students, foreign students coming to the United States to study. And, and it's a huge brain drain, frankly. That that's something that that you you know this you work at MIT you know this is something that we've relied on for years which is you know an open academy globally so that people could come here and there could be a vibrant exchange of ideas this is what the whole Fulbright program is is about and and so they they really are um, you know creating a tremendous um, impediment to enrichment of America by having you know an open flow of global ideas and, and global talent. So you know what we know is that when you isolate people, they go quite mad. You know, we see this with the Unabomber, we see this, this with other isolationists, that human beings are inherently social creatures who need interaction with others. We need interactions in order to be exposed to fresh ideas. We need interaction with others in order to inspire creativity. We need to not lock ourselves up in a basement for so many reasons. Yeah, I mean, literally we're already going quite mad. Just, you know, in, in the months that we've been in lockdown and in the months that we've tried to you know, change to a closed society. I mean, you look at what's happening as we create these echo chambers and how insane family members are that we've talked to for years, but now that we are starting to close ourselves off and not engage with people who have different ideas than, than we have, it has become so unhealthy and so toxic that I think it's it gives us a vision of what life would be like in the United States if we continue to further isolate ourselves, both as a country and as different groups within the country who have political ideas that might not be consistent with others. Why or how can art help? Yeah. And, uh... So it's so interesting because I'm not an artist, I'm not particularly creative, and yet I can look at a work of art and feel it resonate in every pore of my being. There are times when I can't read another sad story and yet I can look at a picture and be completely open and absorb the story or the image that that art conveys. Artists can simply create an image, create a sound, tell a story, and that can silence the noise and allow a truth to be known. And, and I appreciate the courage that they have to do things like read the stories of the, you know, read the declarations, the testimonies of the children who have been abused at the border, allow that trauma into their being and to transform the child's trauma through secondary exposure trauma of the artists in order to help get the children's stories out. Is, uh, the news media in particular, helping the situation at the border? So, uh, so I have to say that I think that the news media has really, really helped us uh, with certain getting the truth out about certain stories. So the separation of children from their parents and making sure that the public knew about children who were being abused in the Clint Border Patrol facility and neglected down there. The, the media has really disappointed me as far as, um, you know, educating the public about what was going on with the children who were being sent to Mexico who are not Mexican and, you know, including many who don't speak Spanish. So I wish that the media understood better that the children in Mexico are in constructive U.S. custody because they have asylum hearings pending 
you know, that they are uh, asylum and that you know, the refugees basically, and, and that they, 89% of them have families or other loved ones in the United States who can keep care, take care of them in regular homes and send them to schools while their asylum claims are being heard. And instead they're being kept in tents and, you know, car, cartel controlled areas. Um, you know, two of the children that a colleague of mine uh, and, and his team interviewed, um, they were killed before the interviewer's plane had even left the ground, you know, in Tijuana. And so the, these children's lives are at risk. They're, they're not receiving access to education, which they have a right to. And um, there is the likelihood that they will remain there for years. You know, the entire world has recognized that children have a right to all of these things, that children have a right to family integrity, that children have a right to be in a safe and secure environment, that they have a right to, to education and, um, and that they have a right to, um, you know, safety, uh, you know, from prosecution and to be free of abuse and neglect. And whether you're talking about the U.S. facilities in the United States that I visited or whether you talk about, you know, the camps and other facilities where children are being sent by the U.S. government um, to Mexico, none of these meet the children's rights that have been recognized under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which has been ratified by every, every country in the world but one. The people who have seen, you know, who have seen Border X and have seen some of the other projects have expressed so much appreciation and such a strong emotional response to these different projects. And they're so appreciative of all the artists who have contributed to them. Um, I think that they have played a key role in helping to motivate people to get off the boat and to call for a change in leadership. I think that, you know, the mistreatment of children in migration and their families has been identified as a key issue that in, to, you know, suburban women in, 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 um, in swing states. And I think that to the extent that those women, those voters find out about and come to understand what's been done to these children and their families, that it can have a dispositive impact on this election. So every artist, every musician, every writer, everyone who has put up the children's, one of the children's quotes on, on a lawn, lawn sign, people who have done street art in, in Philadelphia and elsewhere, the sky riders who have sent messages, you know, in the skies behind their planes um, during major public events. I think all of these people should know that at best, they may have contributed to changing the outcome of this election and in doing so changing the course of history. They have helped to make sure that there is an accurate history of what was done to these children. And in doing so, they have not only honored our nation in making sure that we understand what we've done and, you know, and, and what we have tragically allowed to happen, um, but that these children's identities and experiences are honored and amplified. I just appreciate so much the role that comics have played and the comics artists have played. When I first reached out um, and asked the public to do this, I did not imagine the overwhelming support that we've seen. Um, from comics artists, you know, from South Park to Border X to the illustrations in the children's book. And I am so grateful to all of you for contributing your, your talents. So thank you so much for amplifying your voices. And thank you so much. Um, when I started Border X, uh, I, I had not yet heard of Project Amplify. It was really the, the, the um, linchpin that, that brought a lot of people in that couldn't commit to longer pieces. And it really helped us uh, get those first few comics that then grew out the rest of the project. So thank you so much for all your work with Project Amplify and, and everything else that you're doing. Oh, thank you, Mauricio. I appreciate you so much. You're welcome. Hello, this is Eddie Canales. I'm the director of the South Texas Human Rights Center that is located in Brooks County and Falfurrias uh, is the county seat of, uh, of, the, of Brooks County. Uh, Brooks County has demonstrated to be, uh, over the last 10 years, 
the apex of migrant deaths, and uh, we have a humanitarian crisis of of uh, migrant bodies and skeletal remains being uh, recovered in Brooks County. Uh, this year, it has been, uh, to date, has been 30, 32 bodies that have been, and skeletal remains that have been recovered. This demonstrates a humanitarian crisis that exists on the U.S.-Mexico border. And in, in that note, that crisis uh, is is demonstrated by the Border X comic book anthology, a comic book form, and has been well received by uh, a lot of my colleague members of our organization, uh, individuals, and our universities, NGOs that are, um, are reviewing and taking the anthology and using it in their classroom and using it to educate the community and also decision makers and stakeholders. Without Border X, it, we would not have the tool that, uh, that has been developed by uh, Mauricio Cordero and his colleagues in terms of highlighting the crisis that exists at the border and the different issues that, that are, are very prevalent. Thank you very much for your attention on this short video. Uh, if you need any questions, call uh, or uh, look at the South Texas Human Rights Center Facebook page and our website. Thanks very much. Hi, my name is David Lasky. I am a graphic novelist. I've been making graphic novels and comics for about 30 years. For Border X, I adapted the testimony of a 15-year-old girl who was detained uh, seeking entrance into the U.S. and placed uh, in a, a giant cage with many other children at the Clint border facility near El Paso, Texas. In one page, I tried to give a visual look at her experience and amplify her voice in this way because I am outraged that the U.S. is separating children and parents, putting children in cages, and then not able to reunite them with parents. It's disgusting. And as an artist, uh, you know, I wanted something I could do besides just signing internet petitions. Uh, so this was a way to use my skills to try to help, and I hope it will make a difference for children like this girl who just want a better life in our country. My name is Brian DeLay. I teach the history of the U.S.-Mexican borderlands at UC Berkeley. And I had the good pleasure of meeting Mauricio Cordero uh, last year in 2019 at Stanford University, where I was a fellow. Um, and we got to talking about our shared love of comic books. Um, I've been a big comic book fan my whole life and managed a comic book store for a few years before I went to graduate school. Uh, and he mentioned this remarkable, exciting project that he had um, been spearheading, Border X, to raise awareness and, and, and raise money for immigrant rights on the border. Uh, and he invited me to think about whether or not I might be able to come up with some kind of a, of a short piece based in history. Um, and after thinking about it for a while, I decided that it would be interesting to write a short script about uh, a remarkable Mexican figure. He was a general and a scientist named Manuel Mier y Taran. Uh, and in the early 1830s, he tried to convince uh, his superiors in the Mexican government that something terrible was about to happen in Texas, that the colonists that the country had invited into Texas were um, going to rebel and that the country, that Mexico was going to lose Texas forever. And he failed. He failed to convince them to take the action that they needed, and he killed himself. So it seemed like um, a relevant story for thinking about the crisis on the border today, uh, because in Manuel Mier y Taran's time, it was an immigration crisis. It's just that the immigration crisis was coming from the United States. Uh, so I came up with the script, and uh, to my um, great delight, 
uh, uh, Mauricio agreed to do the artwork himself. And so the finished product is the um, piece in Border X called Texas Killed Him. And it was a, a, a great experience uh, working with Mauricio and being part of this wonderful collection. I'm David Martin Davies. And I'm Yvette Benavides. We are proud to have contributed our journalism to Border X, a crisis in graphic detail. In my story, Water Stations Save Lives, Consuela Terra's incredible artwork brought to life the story that I found in South Texas, where Eddie Canales, founder of the South Texas Human Rights Center, builds and maintains water stations in the desert. Without them, many more immigrants would die of thirst. Kittens in Cages is my story, which documents how children are forced to represent themselves in U.S. immigration court and the utter lack of concern for their safety and their lives. Chris Doré's artwork captures the array of emotions that I experienced while covering this story. Without a doubt, more people need to see these graphic journalism stories and gain a better understanding of the atrocities that are happening on America's southern border. Many thanks to Mauricio Cordero for spearheading this ambitious project and making it a reality. Hi, I'm Samantha Stevenson, and I'm one of the contributors to the Border X Comics Anthology. It was important to me to be part of this project. As an immigrant, I wanted to help in some way, and this gave me the opportunity to, to help in raising money for the South Texas Human Rights Center and also to help raise awareness about what's happening at the border. Um, I think for myself, sometimes it's um, to even acknowledge the what's happening can be so deeply and profoundly distressing um, that sometimes we just turn away because we just don't know what to do. Um, it's I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a politician, I'm an artist and musician. So to be given this opportunity to actually contribute in some way to help um, was just just great. And the process of um, reading the declarations was deeply disturbing um, to really see what is happening there. And uh, I think it's important that art uh, whether it be the performance arts, the visual arts, um, the creative process, to be able to bring these things to light is, is very powerful. Also, I think it's, it's really interesting to have it as a comics anthology um, because it's, it's something that you can hold in your hand, you can read in the quiet of your, wherever it is that you are. It's not a news report in someone else's voice, the barrage of words being thrown at you. And I find that perhaps there's a, a certain connection that can happen there that can be pretty, pretty powerful. Hi, this is Donna Barr, and I'm speaking for Mauricio Cordera's project, his Border X, that will help support uh, actions against the uh, treatment of uh, asylum seekers in uh, the United States and on our borders. And I'm the author of The Desert Peach and Stents, and I've done a lot of work in comics, many uh, projects over the years. And I thought this was a very worthwhile project. Um, my one page that I did uh, has to do with the fact that we are well on our way into the same processes used as in Nazi Germany in the treatment of asylum seekers or people of color or uh, women or anybody else. Uh, it's the same processes. And so that's what I wanted to emphasize in uh, my page that I did for Border X. And Comics are a really good medium for activism because you can take very complex ideas, boil them down and express them simply and directly and concisely using words and images. For example, I think about uh, those little cards that are sometimes in restaurants or in posters about what to do when someone's choking. There isn't even language, but they're essentially a comic that is expressing something very complex simply to a wide audience. The same is true with activism and comics, where you're trying to get an idea across to an audience, a variety of ages, a variety of languages, um, and 
this medium allows you to do that. It also allows you to disseminate the information electronically. It can, you could do it um, in paper. And um, I think that comics really taps into the visual language that people are used to and can consume easily. When I first approached the Safe Passive Project, the idea for this comic, I thought it was going to be about their clients coming to America. So I set up a roundtable interview with five of their lawyers. And over the course of those interviews, we identified specific topics that would be important to their clients. Had, of course, nothing to do with them coming to America. They already knew about that. What they didn't know was, what is a pro bono lawyer? Why should I trust a pro bono lawyer? What do I do if I get suspended from school? What do I do if I get a ticket? Uh, very specific questions, very specific concerns for their client base. After I had all those interviews, I had them transcribed, then I read over them, and using highlighters, highlighted the things that I thought would be the most important. Once I took all of those highlighted things, I boiled them down into a comic script, into a thumbnail, then I handed them off to Peter Cupper, who was the person who drew the comic, and then together we made the comic. This comic was then disseminated within courthouses to sister organizations uh, across the United States and um, could be available digitally and in comic book form. I think what Border X is doing is such a great example of comics and activism because there was an idea, I wanna help immigrants. There was an organization that um, was identified to uh, raise money for then the word went out within the comics community, who can help me do this comic? Many people, myself included, wanted to contribute. And then you have all these stories, and of course, stories are the building blocks for empathy, and without empathy, we can't really move forward. Hi, I'm Tom Hart. I'm uh, the executive director of the Sequential Artists Workshop. We're a grassroots comics organization. We're online and in person in Gainesville, Florida. We teach comics and support any um, any literacy and other uh, projects in the medium. I've never been a very good activist, I'm afraid. I've always, half of me has always wished I could be a better activist, but the other half of me always stays in the art world. I became an artist because I believe in what people have to express. I believe in something really innate and beautiful and interesting about the complexity of people. I believe in what people are allowed to do. I believe, I believe that when people are allowed to be themselves, allowed to flourish when they have the safety and the permission and the guidance and some inspiration that they do most, the most profound, interesting, beautiful things. And so my story in Border X was um, strange. <laughs> it was not a reportage. It was not a documentary. It was not trying to show um, some stories that haven't been already seen. It was trying to uh, investigate some of the emotions and some of the backstory. All of my stories have been fueled by rage. Rage that, this, that people aren't treated like people, mostly. That people aren't treated like they are something valuable, that they have something valuable to contribute. I've always believed that people do and that people empowered by their community, by their broader world, um, will shine beautiful things, provide beautiful things, create beautiful things. And the, the constant destruction of people's spirits and their physical bodies is the, the biggest harm anyone can do. And we do it constantly as a culture. And so my stories, as strange as they are, the one in Border X, as wild as it is, is fueled by that rage and that belief that we should be providing for each other. Uh, 
Um, so we're going to, uh, uh, as Scott mentioned, there is a Q&A um, that, that folks who are uh, attendees from outside MIT can, can write their questions into and, um, and we'll be opening up to questions for, from everyone on screen right now first. Um, I wanted to just step in and, and um, ask a question to, to start things off, Mauricio. Um, and that is, uh, you know, I'm thinking about the the posters that were um, uh, that you showed early on in this presentation from um, the DC punk rock scene that you were connected to, and the, the, particularly the poster, the Rock Against Reagan poster. That was a series of shows that happened all over the the country, really, um, uh, in different punk rock scenes, um, and um, I really have two questions connected to that. And one is just um, about what you um, what you learned and what you have sort of brought forward as an artist from from those origins within um, the DC punk scene, which was a particularly politically engaged scene, you know, compared to others across the country. Um, and the other is actually on a broader political level, thinking about Reagan and thinking about what. Um, the, the, the kind of activism that um, so many were involved in at that moment um, to tie that to the border crisis right now. Because, you know, I think sometimes um, what gets lost in press accounts is, is the, the historical depth of, you know, why people are fleeing from Central America um, to cross the border, um, which of course does date back to the Reagan era. So I was wondering if you could, you know, the two very different questions from looking at that same poster, but um, if you could talk about those to start off. Sure. Um, so I was lucky enough to grow up uh, in the punk scene. And um, like you said, it was not like um, the scene in London or New York or anywhere else. It, it was not concerned with fashion, it wasn't about having spiky jackets and, you know, green hair or anything like that. It was really about politics and, and um, how young people can um, resist and, and really rage against politics and try to channel that into uh, creativity and art. Um, so, you know, early on, I, I, one show, I was like 14, 15, uh, just standing by the stage and uh, Ian McKay and John Stabb and uh, I believe it was Henry Rollins walked up to me and asked me if I was, you know, so-and-so. I, I don't remember what the name was. And I was like, no, but you are in, you know, Henry and, and John Stabb. And th they were, that those were my idols. And to have them actually just be so approachable sort of shaped my attitude towards art and music. I, I, I wanted to patronize art, artists who are approachable and sort of down to earth. Um, and also I, I, I don't have a problem with going up to someone I admire and asking them for something, you know, especially when it's for a, a larger cause. Um, wow, uh, Reagan. Um, so we did have these wonderful shows uh, right there on the mall. Uh, at first they were Rock Against Reagan, um, then Rock Against Bush. Um, and so every year around the 4th of July or on the 4th of July, um, it was sort of a counter um, concert, uh, almost like the Chicago DNC where uh, the MC5 played outside um, to sort of counter what was going on inside. Um, and those were those were quite uh, formative and informative um, concerts and in and, and productions. I uh, you know there would be tons of flyers given out, but also leaflets. Um, I first learned about the the genocide in Guatemala through a, a Millions of Dead Cops uh, album. MDC um, they had an insert that detailed uh, the atrocities and some of the most um, graphic, uh, disturbing photos that I'd ever seen, um, things that were just not being uh, promoted in, in, in the press, 
uh, for obvious reasons. I mean, they're, they're gruesome photos. Um, and so that's sort of blunt honesty uh, and no real tie to um, commercialism. So the interest was getting the truth out, maybe selling a hundred albums, um, but really um, changing minds more than having a pop single or getting on MTV. Um, and the, you know, with Reagan, we, we could talk all, all night about uh, Reagan in Central America, but um, really that was uh, something that opened my eyes, the punk rock movement opened my eyes to, to Reagan's policies and, and really drove me to actually visit um, uh, Nicaragua in 1990, I believe, uh, on a small relief mission right after the war. Um, but I'm not a Latin American expert, so, so I'll just kind of leave it at that. Thanks. Sure. Um, questions? Hamba. Hi, Mauricio. Thank you so much for your talk. I was wondering, there's there's been a lot of conversation about like co-creating with communities. And I was wondering if you, like, why did you choose to like create this um, comic with artists rather than like, commu like immigrant communities, for instance, like create the art with those communities? Uh, yeah. Um, well, part of it is, you know, knowing my skill set and how much time I, I have. Um, I make comics, I know um, professional artists, and I, I, I can get into those circles. Um, and I, I really didn't expect to spend uh, the entire year focused on, on this one project. Um, also, I I, there's something about engaging people that aren't engaged in that specific topic that's very powerful. Um, I would love to do a project with, with migrants um, and there were some migrants uh, involved in border acts and, and even someone who is here uh, without, a, uh, without papers, um, but I won't get too much into that. Um, However, they, they already know the history. They know what's happening, what's happening to them, how they're seen by society. And so I, I thought opening it up to other people um, who might not, um, you know, as Jim points out in the video, uh, there are a lot of teens. And so, you know, for some of the comics, we had up to seven people working on a comic, all looking at this topic and all learning from it and, and really absorbing it. And if I could create um, a few more advocates for the border crisis um, issues, uh, I, I felt that um, it was a good strategy and, and they further you know, reached out to their audiences and, and sort of um, got the, the word much further than I could have done on my own. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Javier. Hello everyone. Uh, Mauricio, thank you for, for the presentation and for, for the project. Uh, my question is, um, do, you, do you see any value in perhaps uh, offering a translated version of this anthology to Spanish? Um, is it feasible even, or have you thought about it? Um, yes, and uh, I've done it. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that I, I didn't fit into the video is that we had a team um, of translators who, uh, I, I knew one of them when I lived in France, and he got a, a large group in Barcelona to take every single page and translate it. So obviously, um, you know, or audience is Latin American. So they work with a few editors, uh, I believe in Arizona and one in Mexico to proofread it, to take the um, sort of Castilian aspect out and, and, and translate it into more universal Spanish. Um, so uh, part of those have 
a few of those have gone out um, to artists. Uh, the rest are sitting on my hard drive until tomorrow <laughs> when I have time again to work on this. And we hope to get a, a new all Spanish edition out. Um, I'd like to try to do another fundraiser or, or somehow um, figure out a way to fund uh, the printing so we can um, uh, get them into the Remain in Mexico camps, uh, physical copies. Um, so we have a few leads. Uh, there's a nun who's uh, doing some incredible work on the border, um, like smuggling reading materials and, and things into uh, the camps. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's uh, an ongoing uh, process, but it, it's, it's not complete and it's kind of time consuming as well to redo the lettering, but luckily we don't have to redo the art. So it'll be forthcoming. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Um, well, I'll, I'll uh, until we have another question, um, I had another question that was more um, about process. And that is, um, uh, I'm curious to hear about the, the relationship, a bit more about the relationship between um, this project, the, um, uh, the project, um, I'm forgetting the name of the, the, the woman who was speaking about Project Ampl Amplify and the Southern Texas uh, Human Rights um, Group. Um, and what, what were the connections between all three? You know, you mentioned in the in the talk that you were already working on the project before um, connecting with Project Amplify, but I'm also interested in the connection with um, with the South Texas Human Rights Group. Mm -hmm. um, it feels like I almost woke up one morning, you know, just thinking, uh, is anybody paying attention? And as I explored. Um, you know, just Google searches and, and whatnot, uh, I can, came across Project Amplify and um, I, I think someone might have pointed me the way and I reached out to, to them. And uh, that's when we struck up a, a sort of partnership on part of the book. So they supplied um, the verbatim transcripts that were presented to the Supreme Court in Flores versus Barr. And I sifted through those and um, gave them out to, to artist teams to um, illustrate. Um, and after that, they, they've just been so supportive. Uh, Warren Binford is someone who I can call uh, at any point and just ask uh, her to try to, you know, <laughs> get the, the word out there or, or other things. She was instrumental in getting uh, Senator uh, Jeff Merkley on board. He wrote the, the prologue to the edition and finally, um, the South Texas Human Rights Center. Um, you know, I estimated that you know, this project would make maybe a few hundred to a few thousand dollars, um, not much more. And uh, as I was thinking, okay, so I'll, I'll direct the money to races. Like just days after that, they did a Facebook post and raised $12 million off of a single Facebook post. And I just, I thought I, I don't want to um, take all this artwork, this all these um, hours of work and raise you know a, a drop in the ocean. I set out to find a very small, very um, lean nonprofit. And so I consulted GuideStar and looked for extremely small budgets. And uh, I came across an ACLU listing of underfunded projects doing essential work on the border. And that's when I, I um, found three organizations and uh, for various reasons, uh, two of them just were like comics. Um, and uh, Eddie was just great. He was like, yeah, gung ho, let's do it. Um, and also the, the mission is, it's a difficult one. And, and I, I like problems, I guess. Um, it's hard to convince someone to fund an organization that um, provides water 
uh, for migrants who are crossing the border, but also um, forensic recovery. Um, it's it's difficult to talk about. It's uncomfortable, and you know it, it's it's hard to pitch. So that attracted me. I I wanted a challenge. I wanted um, people to be aware of um, what we're really talking about, and it's life and death. And so that's uh, how I decided on South Texas Human Rights Center. Heather, you have a question. Yeah, um, I have two questions. The, the first one is you mentioned early on um, your decision to not mention the name of he who must not be named um, throughout the whole uh, work. And I wonder if you could talk more about why you made that decision and how important it was to the project. Um, and um, my other question is, uh, less political, more just aesthetic. Um, we saw such an interesting range of styles and I wonder if you could talk about uh, just a bit more about the decision to use all these different um, visual styles. Uh, and, and you know, one moment I even noticed the back of the current president's head and it looked really like Gary Trudeau draws that hair-like thing, mongoose sort of device on that person's head. Um, so that was a moment where I saw a direct sort of influence of like, oh yeah, I've seen work that looks like this before. And other things I was like, oh, I haven't seen anything that looked like this, you know, it was really unique. So I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about um, the aesthetics. Yeah, uh, the, the aesthetics is simple. I, I just put the project out there and I don't know how I got so lucky. Um, the, the artwork that came back was just really top notch, um, really professional. And the, the sort of variety that I wanted, I, you know, early on, I, I considered for about two seconds doing my own book before I even thought of doing an anthology. And I, I thought, no, it, it, it would be one point of view, it would be one voice, and it would be limited by my reach, my, my scope. Um, so I really wanted to, to do the project in a way that had multiple different viewpoints, styles, approaches, um, and uh, points of view. So um, that was you know, the, the aesthetic bit. Um, not mentioning it, um, so uh, that person thrives on attention and we don't need to give it any more attention than it gets with a, a tweet. Um, also, I, I, I'm just continuously frustrated. So um, I, I was gonna include this in the presentation, but then it was just getting too long. Um, for a little while I was doing a, a comic based on um, that person's antics and uh, I, I couldn't keep it up. I, as soon as I finished a comic, the issue was irrelevant because it was replaced by another issue, um, you know, a firing. So if I spent hours drawing this one person and a week later, they were out of the administration. Um, and the same sort of dynamic was happening with some of these important issues that we were losing the thread on uh, the migrant crisis because he was doing some other clown show or you know, dragging a pony and balancing a ball on his nose and all these other um, ridiculous things that, that he does to get attention. Um, so I, I really didn't want his inclusion in this volume to take away any of the energy or attention from where it should be on the individuals who are actually affected um, by this crisis. And uh, we did negotiate that. Um, that one image that you mentioned, I, I think there might be two appearances in the book and I asked, and the artists were very um, polite and accommodating to not show his face and to not write his name out. And, um, and I'm glad for it, no regrets. Uh, I think he's implicated enough um, by his policies and actions that we don't need to name or depict him anymore. Uh, there's, a, there's a question from, uh, from the chat. 
um, from Caitlin. Um, Mauricio, Mauricio, thank you for inviting your SAW colleagues to this important discussion. How have the children whose stories are amplified in this project responded to seeing the comics? Uh, well, we, we don't know. Um, the, all the testimony is anonymous um, for various reasons for uh, the protection of the children. Um, so, so I don't know if any of the, the children in the exhibits um, has actually seen the comic. Um, and that is what I have to, hope to do um, later on is try to find a few agencies that can distribute uh, the electronic version and the Spanish uh, version. Um, but yeah, sadly, we, we just can't get that sort of feedback. Other questions? Uh, a question over here. Sajid. Thank you. Uh, hi, Mauricio. I'm a visitor to the lecture. Um, very impressive work. I'm curious to ask your thought, having completed the work and looking back at it at this point, um, how do you situate the decisions that you made for one reason or the other up front uh, to go with as an independent work. And even thinking at the outset about a sort of a, a punk rock perspective, if you will, right? Uh, governing the aesthetic. But what's been realized now, the work you have in front of you, um, I'm curious to get your thought about how you see it having similarity or dissimilarity to the kind of stuff Joe Sacco has done, right? Uh, years ago. Curious to hear your thoughts about that and how you see sort of the elasticity of comics to do this kind of work. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, Joe Sacco. <laughs> um, I, th I think that harks back to, um, I love his work. I love what he's done. I'm not a journalist. I'm not trained in journalism. I'm not a historian. I make comics. <laughs> so I wouldn't, um, it, it just wouldn't be my my um, my wheelhouse to, to try to do uh, a sort of in-depth um, project on the border. Um, however, I have opinions and I, I have Google, so, so I can't find enough information to provide my viewpoint. But really, um, going back to that punk aesthetic, it was a very inclusive movement. You know, um, if you had a band that had been rehearsing for three weeks in a basement in you know, Falls Church or Alexandria, you could be on stage with Minor Threat or, you know, um, later on Fugazi or, you know, some, some of the key bands. Um, so I think this, um, this inclusive spirit uh, permeated through, through the, the Border X um, anthology. Some of the artists are actually first time comic creators. Uh, a lot of the longer pieces I, I sort of ripped out of the hands of writers who are like, well, I've never written a comic before. And I was like, no, no, it'll be okay, come on. Um, and so we, we sort of coached them on how to translate their script into uh, comic book form. Um, for example, Brian DeLay, he, he um, had never done a comic, but was really, really enthused by comics. So, um, so yeah, I think by providing a, a large platform, uh, getting, a lot of different voices and it, it, it just harkens back to that DIY uh, spirit. Thanks. I'm sorry, Is it, did I answer your question? That's good, thank you. Thanks, Mauricio. Thanks. Other questions? I just want to make a comment. I think Joe Sacco would love this comic. Uh, Joe Sacco has a new work out uh, titled Paying the Land that just came out uh, about a year ago. But uh, this is very much, uh, Mauricio's a cousin. Uh, this, is, <laughs> this is the same realm. And I think these two comic artists would be uh, very, very compa uh, compatible. And um, yeah, so anyway, that's interesting to mention that because that's also uh, art that has uh, advocacy, but it's it's art that uh, is formed uh, in a different way, but very, very similar. Uh, so anyway, it's, it's worth mentioning. That's a nice, nice comparison. 
If anyone has Joe Sacco's address, I'm happy to send him a copy. So uh, I have a question, Mauricio. Um, I, I think about sort of uh, having been outraged by the same things you were outraged over the years. Um, and one of the things that over a, uh, I've come to realize is that how little, at least I don't know whether it was ever, ever otherwise, but how little accountability there is over time. In other words, no one's paid, no one's paid a penalty for what the Reagan administration did in Latin America. No one's paid a penalty for what's happened in happened in Iraq in the first decade of this century. Um, uh, any thoughts about whether we can, whether I mean, it's it's critical that we're what you're doing, what you're doing to raise awareness of the of the problems. Is there any thought about a role art could have in terms of actually? Trying to bring people to account, I guess. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, trying to bring people to bring people to account for their crimes. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, you know, it's tough. Yeah, with without getting mystical and you know, karmic yeah. or, or anything like that. I. Um, uh, we recently saw a, a Shepherd Fairy um, exhibit in Los Angeles and it was wonderful to revisit um, scumbags like Nixon and Reagan and all their awfulness. Um, and so I think uh, that's part of what artists who create political art do is they, they preserve the ugliness. They don't look away. They, they look straight into that storm and say, you know, we're, we're watching and we're recording it. And um, that was one of the goals with Border X is to try to create something um, of quality that would endure um, past this administration. And hey, guess what? In just like, what, 60 days, um, Border X will have endured past this administration and, and it remains an account of some of the atrocities, but to be clear, um, the border migration uh, crisis has been going on well before um, this current. Event. So, um, you know, there, there's a lot of accountability to spread around there. Yeah. Okay, well, we're up on 630. Um, so I just wanted to, um, with everyone, uh, uh, thank you so much for, for your time and, and for, for the putting together the presentation. And, um, and I look forward to being able to, to read, um, to read the, to read Border X. Um, and actually that's, a, that's a question. And, uh, to end with how, how can we all get our hands on, uh, physical copies of, of Border X? Border X, um, it's really available through any uh, retailer, uh, mostly online, you know, um, okay. it's not really stocked on the shelves. But if you go to www.border-x.com, um, you can order it through the big players like Amazon and Barnes and Nobles, but also through Aid Books, through Indie Bound, through all the smaller distributors. And there are links on the website to the, the smaller distributors. And the best thing, honestly, is just call up your local bookstore and, and do like a curbside pickup, you know, and, and just support them. They, they need it, especially the comic book stores. They're really taking a hit. So um, if you're here in Somerville, uh, Kamikaze is a wonderful place. They've been very supportive. Um, and yeah, support your local merchants, please. Right. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Right. Bye.